Welcome to Cannabis Investing Newsletter. Today, I want to look at Aurora Cannabis. I'm going to take a good solid look at their metrics and try and figure out where they are, where they could be. I've mentioned a few times that I wouldn't be surprised if these guys go BK. Will they go to zero or is there a shot? I'm going to break down these numbers for you and show you from a long-term perspective what's going on here. This stock is pretty popular, gets a lot of day traders, and I totally get that. Over the past, what, five, seven to five uh, trading days, it's gone up about 10%. You can get some out of that. That's good money if you're day trading that. Even today, we saw some price movement to the upside. So you can get involved and day trade this. I get that. But is this something you'd want to be going long and sleeping overnight on? This is something I wanted to take a look at. I'm D.H. Taylor. Been involved in the markets professionally for some 30 plus years. I've been scrutinizing over 350 different cannabis stocks to find out which ones are a buy, which ones are a bust. And today, of course, Aurora Cannabis. Now, I'm a value investor. So I'm looking, I'm asking the same principles of all 350 of these companies. If I put a dollar into a share or 10 cents or $10, whatever that basis is for that particular share, what kind of value is this company going to create over a 12-month period of time, maybe 18 months, 24 months, depending on the stock, where they are? That's what value investing is. But this is a stock that a lot of people get involved in simply to go and do some day trading. So you have to also simultaneously marry growth investing with cannabis stocks. I'm looking at companies that are increasing some 20, 30% on a quarter basis for their revenues alone. Cannabis is booming for a lot of people. This is a once in a generational opportunity to create significant wealth. And you want to get some of that. I know a lot of people day trade Aurora and they're, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to play that game. Awesome. My niche tends to be small cannabis companies simply because there's a lot more bang for the buck. Aurora Cannabis used to be what we think of as the darling of the cannabis industry. These guys came out with an exceptional plan. They've got entire facilities where no humans actually, ever actually get inside. They've got machines that will go in, pick up entire tables, bring those tables with the cannabis on it to the, to the trimming room and things of that nature. They fully automated certain aspects of their operations. Plus, they utilized some of the sunniest areas in Canada uh, with solar paneling and things like that, trying to keep the cost of production as low as possible. Energy costs for cannabis are some of the highest costs that you're going to see with growing cannabis. Outside of energy costs, uh, there isn't a whole lot of input cost on some aspects of, of cannabis growing. Here's a chart. It's the hourly chart. You can see that there has been some up movement in the past couple, two, two or three days over the uh, past few days. Saw some good movement today. Had you been able to get a piece of that from a day trader's perspective, that's a good trade. But what I wanted to show is maybe some of the risks associated with holding on to these trades for longer term periods of time. At the same time, I'm going to try and be balanced. Aurora may actually have some kind of a chance going forward. But they've got to start nailing some of these metrics. When, you, when I show you these uh, graphs and everything on all the financials I've got, some of the metrics, they just simply don't add up. It's risky. They are more than likely going to have to go back to the cash register and uh, make a withdrawal. They did so back in January. I don't expect that to be too much of a dilution to move the price of the stock down lower. Here's a more, uh, the daily chart going back a about a year's worth of time, you can see the big move up back in um, October, November when they the blue wave began. You can then see it again in January when there was a big move again uh, after the Georgia runoff election when the Senate went blue. Now we have House, Senate, and the executive all holding uh, Democratic seats. So the thinking is that cannabis is going to be legalized on a federal level. I don't know, this guy Biden, 
he doesn't exactly sound as if that's his top priority. I'm just going to leave it at that. Let politics be politics. Mostly speaking, it looks as if the federal government is just going to keep letting the states do their thing. On a more long-term perspective, you can see the big moves we had upwards going back all the way, what is that, 2018? Then in 2019, you could see the long, slow decline downwards. And this is painful. The high on that, 160 on that spike all the way back in uh, 2018. The low, we just saw it, four bucks. If you've been holding on to that, that is a painful move. Listen, cannabis itself can be an excellent investment. This is a once in a generational opportunity. You can make wealth. But holding on to a stock this long, a loser like this, that, that is not the way to gain wealth. Now the question is, can this stock turn around? Let's look at some revenue pictures. Printed $53.2 million the last quarter. You can see the progression all the way back into mid-2019 when they started offering guidance early 2019 saying, not quite there, not quite there. Then you can see the drop down $42 million for the quarter. Okay, these this revenue growth although in the beginning looked really solid, has really flatlined into nothing. Even Canopy Growth is printing some solid numbers. Tilray, Afria, that joint venture, they're starting to see some increases. So I could expect to see Aurora start printing exceeding quarterly numbers, probably finally push through on 60 million. Let's see. But that's just part of the story. Gross revenues, you got to they've got to do something about gross margins. Let's take a look at their gross margins. 25.6% was the last quarter. They were at 40% the quarter before, and I actually thought that was pretty decent. I thought they could probably get there. If they can get to say 50, 55%, they're almost there. The problem is their business model has them sort of focusing on the lower cost wholesale side of the business. Everybody got burned by that. That was all of 2019. Everybody has hit the brakes, turned backwards, and are now looking to put together some premium products. These guys are no different. They're looking to do premium branding because that's where the higher gross margins are. You can't survive with 25.6% keep on revenue, revenue that isn't even really growing that well. Let's push forward operating costs. This is where the real blood starts pouring. $50 million. Now look back just some four quarters. They were at $103 million. They slashed everything down in half, more, just slightly more than half. All right. They were increasing operating costs as they went. Topped out at 103, slashed it down to 50. Mind you, we go back to revenue. They just printed 53 million in revenue and they only have 25% in gross margins. This mathematics doesn't add up. That 50% or that 50 million is something like 95% of total revenues. Here's a look at the efficiencies. And that's what this metric shows is total operating costs over top of total revenue. A company that is able to efficiently produce the product from a total operational standpoint is going to be much better off than the next company. So these are become competitive metrics that you want to start looking at. Now operating costs deal with running the business outside of producing the product. Cost of goods, that's producing the product. Packaging, rolls for pre-rolls, vape uh, packaging, things like that. That is cost of goods. But SGNA, sales, general, administrative, that's operational. That is total operating costs, and that is the other part of running the business. You take your total revenues, you subtract cost of goods, you subtract total uh, operating costs, that leaves you with operating profit. They're printing 95.1%. They're spending $50 million on $53 million in revenue. They aren't making any kind of profits. And we, when we move down the financial statement, you can see that. 
the quarter before, mind you, they they printed some 40% gross margins just before. The total operating costs were roughly about the same. You can see the difference of how that trickles down to the bottom line. That drop from 40% down to 25% on gross margins, you can see how that affected EBITDA profitability. At 13, minus 13 million, they're, they're close. But this is just EBITDA. So now EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, uh, depreciation, amortization. You're going to see deductions for costs not associated with normally running the business, uh, shutting down a, a facility, taking a loss on selling a facility, things like that might show up the next step beyond EBITDA. But EBITDA to us is important simply because when you look at EBITDA, you're asking the question, is this business model viable? If you have revenues and you have costs of goods and you have total operating costs, are they positive at the end of the day? It, this will, is where we first look. If we are achieving a bit of posit, po positivity, then we can move forward to net earnings. Unfortunately for Aurora, this is an ugly picture. They lost $230 million for the last quarter. If you look back four quarters before, this is when they really kind of hammered down and started restructuring. They lost a billion the, uh, four quarters ago. That puts it into perspective of how they're having to shift everything. But at $230 million for a loss, that's steep. They only had $53 million in revenues. Nonetheless, they did do a capital raise. Here we're going to look at cash on hand. They're sitting on about $305 million. All right. I don't expect too many more quarters where we see minus $230, hopefully. But I don't think that $305 is going to carry them. I think they're probably going to go back to the... Uh, to the markets and try and raise some capital. Maybe they bring in another 100 to 200 million. That isn't going to be too much from a dilutional standpoint. They've got about 200 million shares outstanding. Stocks trading about nine bucks. If they did say 20 million shares at nine million, you're raising 100 million. That's only 180 million. That's only 10 percent of total shares. All right, if they have 20, 200 million shares and they issue an additional 20 million, that's only 10%. Even if they did that and there was some linear mathematics that would state, oh, if you issue 10% more shares, there should be a requisite drop of 10%. This doesn't even get us close to on a price basis where we were just last week. So I'm going to dismiss the whole dilution thing. I just don't think that it's the stock's going to move that much lower based on that. Nonetheless, I do expect some kind of dilution coming forward. I usually look at per share book value because I want to understand where the company is on sort of a value basis as to if you liquidated everything, but I bought this stock, what's my worst case scenario? And that's what per share book value kind of shows us. I think I saw the close today at about nine bucks. The per share book value is about $9.40. So they're kind of jiving right now. Typically, you do see uh, the shares to be above the per share book value. And the reason why is there's momentum, there's people buying, there's and, and assets themselves are increasing. Unfortunately, as we see with per share book value, Aurora has been selling off assets over the past several quarters. So their asset base has been uh, heading lower as well. Liabilities have been set, uh, heading downwards in, in conjunction with that. So I'm not really looking at this decline as a bad thing because it is in conjunction with all the shifting that the company's do doing. Question now becomes, we're at nine. Can we go to 10 or 11 in the next quarter? I want to stress that there is a need for cash. They just took that $230 million loss in the last quarter. 
they've got $305 million cash on hand. 200 million shares outstanding with a share price of $9.01. I think it was the last time I looked. Again, I think if they issued 10% more shares, even 5%, you're probably going to see almost no movement whatsoever from the stock. But that would bring in an additional $180 million. That would be sorely needed. They need to improve their profit margins. Off of 53 million, they had 25% gross margins. I showed you that the quarter before they had 40% gross margins, their EBITDA loss was only about 13 million. But this quarter, they had 25% gross margins and their EBITDA loss was far greater. So that gross margin is really crucial when you start moving down the financial statements. That 25% was 39 million in cost of goods. This left them with only 13 million for gross profits. They need to hit at least maybe 50% on gross margins. This would mean that they would keep about 26 million of that 53 million. At the same time, they need to push that revenue up high. I'm certainly aware that they're doing putting in those efforts. Uh, total operating costs, they have got to decrease these or significantly increase revenue because on a on a relative basis you cannot justify where they are their total operating costs 95 percent of revenue all right 25 percent gross margins this math just simply does not add up i'm not saying they can't get there they may very well be selling off more facilities and then that will cut their total operating costs. They're not going to have to hemorrhage from a facility. They're clearly uh, is being underutilized at this time. Uh, they they printed about 51 million off the uh, total operating costs off that 53 million in revenue. They, they need to either triple their revenue to justify their total operating costs at 51 million, or they need to decrease their costs down to by some 35 million. This is a bit of a stretch anytime soon, but it's not that it's impossible. I can see an increase in revenue, maybe 60, 70, 80 million. I could easily see them hitting their 40% number once again, maybe starting to exceed that 45% on gross margins. Okay, this is them turning the corner. At the same time, should they be able to cut their costs on total operating costs down to some more reasonable number, something far smaller than 95%, it's very possible that you can see a turn of the corner. At that time, it may be possible that Aurora starts really kind of turning around. If they can do that, they're going to need to raise some amount of cash, but not a whole lot, as long as they don't have a quarter like they just had. Here's another look at the long-term chart. The fact of the matter is, they will raise more cash. All right, They will very likely improve their gross margins. They will probably increase revenues. They've got to decrease total operating costs. If they were to start putting these figures together. This is a stock that potentially could turn around. I know they are working very diligently at doing this. And if that's the case, this nine bucks might be a bargain of a stock. But they've got to start hammering a little harder on some of these metrics that they're trying to attain. They've got to really start increasing that revenue and those gross margins. So let's see what they do in the future. Personally, Time is money. Because of that, I'll always tap the brakes on this particular stock. Next quarter, a couple months from now, if these guys print something solid, I may turn right back around and say, you know what? Take a look at this stock. Give them an honest look because this is a facility that could lead low cost. Keep in mind the automation systems that they have, the the, the solar panels and things like that. Certainly other companies are doing that, but this particular company may actually prove to really accelerate should they gain that footing. 
If you like my content, please, by all means, I've got a free email newsletter down below. I got a link, click it, send you to a page, sign up, you get a free email newsletter. And I put all my content with the videos linked to you on an email, send it out almost every day. Uh, at the same time, for those of you who are looking, I've got a monthly subscription, gets you 100% access to my website, all my analysis, all the companies. I launched this website back on the 1st of March. I already done about 50 companies, analyzed them kind of deep like this with requisite videos. So you get it for five bucks a month. That subscription gets you 100% of that content. I appreciate supporting the website. Um, since I've launched, hundreds and hundreds of people have signed up, and I can't thank you enough. I think it's awesome. The, the YouTube channel here is really growing, so we're getting there. At the same time, for those of you who know me, I am also simultaneously a master coffee roaster. And I'm heading back down to South America, Central America, to be hitting up the coffee farms. I'm looking to get back into competitive coffee roasting. Yes, that does exist. Looking for quality coffees, 90 plus. I'm looking for 12 of them, one from every country down in the South and Central Americas. You can try my coffee. It gets delivered to you right out of here in California. So appreciate you stopping by. I'm D.H. Taylor. We'll see you in the next video.